MLS Cup 2019 was everything we should have expected it to be. Sure, there were four goals to enjoy, but it was a cagey, tentative, and tactical affair. The Seattle Sounders allowed Toronto FC to have 65% possession, and I say allowed because I think that Seattle is the better attacking team with better talent. In the end, Seattle ended up having the same number of shots as Toronto, despite their lower numbers in possession. Winning these kinds of matches isn't about all-out attack and mesmerizing flair. It's about staying compact defensively and frustrating your opponents, forcing them to become complacent, and then finding your moments and striking, being ruthlessly efficient, as Seattle has done in this entire tournament. So in this video, we're going to take a look at how a team with so little of the ball could beat their opponents so handedly, and what Seattle Sounders did to keep themselves strong in defense, to hold off the talented Toronto FC attack, and then what made them so efficient when they did get into the final third, and how they were able to break down this team on three different occasions. Let's take a second look. The first thing we'll look at is how the Seattle Sounders set up. They lined up in the usual 4-2-3-1, with the only change being Roman Torres sliding into center back for Javier Arriaga. The key to Seattle's shape was staying narrow. Once the ball moved to one flank and the opportunity arose, they could collapse and keep the ball pinned to that sideline or deal with the incoming cross. This is fairly standard for teams that want to sit back. Seattle did sit back, and they often had seven men back, and when they really wanted to defend, even appeared to have six defenders. What Seattle did without the ball wasn't revolutionary. Many teams try, and many teams also fail to defend deep. A major aspect to Seattle's stout defense was actually how they reacted once they gained control of the ball. Most teams use this chance to keep some possession. They expand and spread the field, like Toronto did, to create more space. Seattle did the opposite. Instead of opening up when they regained possession and putting themselves at risk to be hit on the counterattack, Seattle stayed compact with the ball. Often it meant that when the defenders were put under some pressure, the Sanders had to just clear it upfield and hope for some holdup play. Michael Bradley, alongside the Toronto defense, did a good job to get on the end of these clearances and keep Seattle pinned back. Seattle's plan then, when they could, was to play direct. When they won it on one wing, it wouldn't get switched to the other unless they got into the attacking third. Instead, they would play combinations down the wing in an attempt to get past the attacking-minded Toronto fullbacks. On most occasions, Seattle only sent three men forward when they initiated counterattacks, usually just Raul Ruiz Diaz, Nicolas Ladero, and Jordan Morris. It wasn't until later in the second half, when Toronto began to tire, when Seattle began to send four or even five men forward. This extra manpower ended up being the extra bit that Seattle needed, and the first two goals ended up coming from that initial push. Here is a better look at Seattle's intentions. Here we have Gustav Svensson stepping up to win the ball on the left wing. When he wins it, Svensson could pass it backwards to Brad Smith, who could then put it out the other way to Christian Roldan, as Seattle has a big hole that they can exploit in front of the Toronto defense. Instead, Svensson turns up the line, and it actually becomes even more apparent here that Svensson should go into the middle. There are three Seattle players with the space to drive forward, but Svensson puts it up the line for Rui Diaz, and Bradley cuts it out. Even with Schmetzer's conservative system, Svensson could have went to the middle here and not left his team exposed. But this clip shows the mindset that the Sounders had to push up the line and not play square balls in the midfield that can be much, much riskier. It's after the hour mark here, and Victor Rodriguez has come onto the field, and now we get to see his influence on the game and how much better Seattle got at playing in tight spaces on the flanks. Toronto did a good job of matching Seattle and collapsing onto the far sideline. Victor Rodriguez pushes it past Bradley and Auro up the line in what is some very, very lazy defending. He lays it across for Rui Diaz, and the only difference here between the goal that we'll see later on is that he doesn't end up getting the layoff back, as Rui Diaz smashes it against Omar Gonzalez. But if we rewind a bit, we'll see that if Rui Diaz gets his head up, there's a lot of space on the right wing for Kelvin Leerdam, who is essentially in on goal. Let's backtrack even farther now, and let's look at Leerdam's quote-unquote goal. This is one of the few times that Seattle switches the point of the attack, and of course it only comes in the final third. It starts up the left from Jovin Jones, now switched flanks for the moment, but not yet dropped back into the left-back role when Brad Smith comes off and Victor Rodriguez goes on. 
He cuts it to the top of the box, and there is space here for Ladero to find a pass and switch the play because Michael Bradley had to slide out to cover Jones. I mentioned earlier, but Seattle's main plan in getting forward is pushing the ball past the attacking Toronto fullbacks, and Aro got exposed multiple times to this tactic, and it was often Michael Bradley who had to help out. The pass doesn't give Lodero a great chance to open his hips and cross it again, and it's fairly difficult to control, so he has to stop it right in front of him. It's now the overload on the left, from fullback Brad Smith, that ends up giving Lodero the time to swing this ball wide. Smith runs into the channel here, and it's actually a really good option for a pass, but his run also forces Bradley, Gonzalez, and Mavinga to hesitate in anticipation of the pass going to Smith, so no one steps up to Ladero, and he now has time to scan the field and find Leardam. It's a great run and cutback from Jones to get it to Ladero, off the tightly contested wing, and then a fantastic run from Smith to drag away the attention of the defenders near Ladero. Gonzalez now has the chance to press Ladero, but he has the time now to get the pass out to Leardam. It ends up being a good recovery from Benize to get back in position from the wing, but his challenge is really, really weak, and Leardam just drifts around him as the French winger's challenge flies by. Benize needs to be more patient in his own box, because Leardam now has the time to pick his head up and smash the ball across the box. There's certainly some luck involved, but Leardam only gets into the position to get that luck because Benize overcommits. Up until that point, it was really clever play from Seattle to create space and openings, but in the end, Toronto is its own worst enemy. Of course, partially because it's an own goal, but also because Auro was caught out of position in the beginning of this play, and then Benize missing his challenge. Now let's look at, perhaps, the best play of the entire match in Seattle's second goal. Once again, the Sounders enter the final third on the left flank and have five men in that portion of the field. Victor Rodriguez, back to when he's on the field, is put under pressure by two Toronto players. But look at how Nico Lodero drifts into this position to create a triangle, which is how the combination begins. Rodriguez plays it back to Svensson to get out of pressure, and is clever because he begins making a run once he plays the ball instead of staying static and just watching the play unfold. Now let's take a moment as we can appreciate how this unfolds, as Rodriguez has now beat his man off the ball by making that run, and Ladero has sucked Bradley away from the top of the box in zone 14. This is important because Omar Gonzalez is now exposed for what becomes a 1v1, and he isn't quick enough to change direction as Rodriguez cuts across him. Now let's watch it back again just to see this thing of beauty. The Sounders might have been the most offensive team in this match, but they also were the most creative and unselfish with runs when they got into the attacking third. It's amazing how a team who are so organized and compact on defense, and even on offense for 80% of the field, were able to suddenly find bursts of speed and creativity to find openings in the few times they got the ball. Many may have found Seattle boring or cagey in this match, and it's true that for long stretches they were focused on grinding the game to a halt but they scored three goals against Toronto and LAFC with this strategy. And it's evident that there's attack and quality in this team. It's just that they picked their moments. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe. Do whatever you can. Until next time, I'm Emmett McConnell. Have a great day.